I think one universal sensibility we can all agree on is that we are living through extraordinarily tumultuous times. And what that feels like is a sense of groundlessness, a sense of despair, a sense of absolute terror in which we feel ill-equipped to deal. Death is so big, and we are so ill-prepared as a culture that even the very day that he died, he was sure he was going to live. It started with him at the edge of the bed not being able to get up, and then the moment came where he, you know, his lung was filling with fluid, and he was unable to breathe. And I could see the terror in his eyes. And watching your father drown in your arms, you can't put words to that. But I knew deeply that he was terrified. He was not ready. And that's the moment of refuge. In that moment, I became my dad's refuge. I was stroking his hand. I was whispering in his ear. Let go. Let go. Let go. You will be OK. The last words that my father uttered before he slipped away were, I see them. I see them. And I knew what he meant. But then it came time for my existential moment. And it's one thing to be there for another person. It's a completely different one to be there for yourself, to be in that predicament yourself. So my moment is, you know, I found a lump. It was benign, thankfully. But it was no less shocking and no less terrifying. I, I went into a massive depression. I was terrified. I was having panic. I remember having a nightmare, waking up in a cold sweat. It was a nightmare of me drowning. It was a nightmare of me drowning. And it dawned on me, drowning, choking, dying. I saw him choke. I was choking in my nightmare. I saw him die. And I didn't want to die. I didn't want to die. I wasn't ready to die. And despite all my training, almost 20 years of studying Tibetan Buddhism, all my years of meditation practice, all my years of psychotherapy, didn't matter a damn, if I'm completely honest. And that's the rude awakening. You too are going to die. Are you ready? And I was saying no with every ounce of my being. No, I'm not ready. You know, so based on this utter terror, I needed to find a remedy. You cannot face death with your intellect. It doesn't matter how many books you studied or what someone tells you. You have to have a, an experience. And I remember the medicine had kicked in. 
and the world dissolved as pe only people who have experienced psychedelics know into that temporal, like trans-temporal, timeless space. All your monologue, your inner chatter cease. Everything became like a panorama, like a kaleidoscope. And I felt myself melting, melting, melting deep, deep into the tree and the tree into the roots and the roots into the ground and the ground opened into a very, very deep primordial space. And all there was for a moment was breath. And then I heard my father's voice. And he said to me what I said to him in his passing moments. Let go. It's not the end and you're not alone. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It's the difference between kicking and treading water and gasping for air and pushing and pushing and pushing and that sense of deep rest when you hit the pillow and the bed is supporting you and you can let go like letting go into sleep knowing you're going to wake up the next morning you get good, deep rest. And that's what it was like. Good, deep rest. Those really deep moments of surrender under the psychedelic experience, they're also temporary. I mean, that's one thing we have to keep in mind. I mean, I didn't come out of that forever transformed and with, with un, un, unending amounts of confidence about my, my inevitable big D death. So I remember about six months after my psychedelic experience, we were on pilgrimage. And I was with my teacher, Geshe Tenzin Zopa, who is a profound Tibetan master. The Tibetans are the psychonauts of the death experience because they have invested much of their tradition in mastering the art of conscious rebirth. And we were in Varanasi. And there are thousands upon thousands of people and it's pandemonium and chaos. And I'm following my teacher, it's just me and my teacher. I'm following him through what are called gullies, these little passageways and stairways and nooks and crannies that are leading through this ancient 4,000, 5,000 year old city down to the Ganges. And we make it through the gullies and onto the sacred cremation ground, the charnel ground overlooking the banks of the Ganges. And there they are corpses on fire, being burnt on the pyres. A cacophony of sounds and smells and sights, and my nervous system is just crumbling under the sensory overload. And I was like, Geshe-la, I'm afraid to die. I'm afraid to die. And geshe looks at me and says, nothing to fear. It's like checking into a hotel. You stay one, two nights and then you check out. And I got so furious. I was like, I don't need this shit. I know all of that, but I'm fearful. I'm terrified to die here. Help me with this. And he grabbed me back and he said this, when you die, think of me and I will be there for you and I will help you through. You will not be alone. You will never be alone. Not just this life, 
but for every life, I will be there for you. I don't have many good qualities, but one that I do have is called Guru Devotion. Guru Devotion in the Tibetan tradition is the confidence, the confidence in your teacher. More than the confidence in your teacher, it's the confidence in your teacher's realization that there is something truly transformed about them and to recognize that whatever is in the guru is also in you. And that's what refuge is, that's what guru devotion is, that's what a psychedelic experience affords, that's what a meditative experience affords, that's what a pilgrimage affords. It's not what you know, it's what you already are. It's what you already are. So they say that you just ride the energy through through death, bardo, and between. You just ride the energy of love. And you don't get so attached or bound up in the eddies of holding on to the sandcastle at the shoreline. You go in ready to create, not taking it so seriously, seeing it like a disposable artwork a mandala that is constructed, consecrated, and then bequeathed to reality, let go again and again and again. Is it easy to do? No. Can you do it conceptually down? Probably you can, you can do an approximation of it. What if you did it viscerally up as an experiment or laboratory with your life? I surrender. I recognize who I am. I recognize my vast power potential to create. I bequeath this as a gift, a temporary gift on the world. I relinquish myself of any grasping at result. And I allow myself to go through that iteration after iteration after iteration after iteration. Think about how much energy is expended to resist the cave, to resist the cave, and yet, Cave is the only place where we will find the treasure. Death is the only place where we will find the soul. The darkness, there we will find the light and no other place. So it is incumbent on each one of us to look there in the shadow, to look where we are most afraid, to go to the place we are most afraid. because there we will find the pearl, there we will find the treasure, there we will reconnect with the soul. And that is the boon, the elixir, that we have always been seeking. That is the journey home.